All right. So what we're going to do is to solve more problems. It's going to be different from I've done different problems for uh, the different sections, but very similar. So what I will do here is go and solve a, yet a new problem. And um, all right, so I will need to make a copy of the Smith chart. Take this, make a copy. Okay, and I will clean it up and then I will will I put um, solve a problem. So So it's going to be more of the same, even if um, for our lectures, we're going to proceed and then we are going to do some matching, what we call, but the examples that I will do today will not be on new material. It's going to be on what we have covered so far, just for more practice. So here I'm going to give the following problem. And then I will, I, mean, I will write it first of all. So, problem one. Let us consider what would I do? Um, let us consider that we have a transmission line, not that one, pick one. Okay, and we'll assume that this line is connected. So I will, I will do that. Let me shorten it a little bit here. Shorten it here. Okay. And then I will put a similar line on the other side. Copy and copy, paste here. And um, then in between, so this, these are two lines, separate lines. They have, I will assume all of the lines now, just for simplistic, have the same characteristic impedance, but for a moment, follow what I'm doing, then in between those in a series arrangement, I have another line and then it looks like this, let me see. Okay, let me put that. And then we are gonna assume that um, then there is a, a, con a connection here, a wire connection practically like this. And then there is another wire connection like this. And then they are connecting here. So, um, and then on this end, I will assume that the line is, this particular line is open. And then here on the other ones, I'm gonna have at this end a load. And this is the L. 
and then what I will have is um, a length for this one to be D1, a length for this one to be D2, and a length for this one to be D3. All right, and then also I don't need to make it this huge. It needs to be a little smaller. And then I will assume that um, the transmission lines have the same characteristic impedance, all of them. Dr. Kitagi? Yes. Will that transmission line at the bottom in purple act, as, act like a capacitive element since it's open? Uh huh. You are very good with that. Depends depends on, on the length. It could be capacitive or inductive. Oh, okay. All right. Sense. Yeah, right. excellent. Um, and then, so I will have here a, a prime. I will have here B, B prime. Here, C. C prime, well, that should be a little shorter to be together with the other one. Because to be accurate, ac actually, yeah, they have to be there. And D, D prime. And then here, E, E prime. And, um, in the beginning, we'll do what we call an analysis problem. So we'll solve this as an analysis, and I will say, I'm going to give you all of the data, and then I'm going to ask you to find the input impedance here. And then you will see how I need a design problem, the same one, I can do it as a design, and then we'll discuss it. So the problem says, consider this transmission line, obviously. All right, so consider. that what do i give you z naught is equal to 50 ohms all right so this one is open a lot of times i will show the open like that well maybe um i don't want you to consider it as a short so you need to remember that if i do it i need to do it a little better so it's gonna be like this that means open all right um then it's uh, 50 ohms then i will assume that zl is like um 50 plus j 25 ohms that's a load i will assume um that d1 is 0.1 lambda d2 is 0.2 lambda d3 is um 0.1 lambda okay and then i will ask you say find z input at a a prime okay so that is the problem so solution when you solve, I have said that multiple times, I will repeat it again. When you try to solve a problem like this, as I do all the times, whenever I, anybody gives you a problem, write it down at least the schematic, even if the schematic is in the book and I, the book gives this to you. Or when I give it to you, for example, a problem like that as a final, a part of the final, and I give it to you, I want you to rewrite it. Why is that? There are two things that happen when you rewrite the problem. First of all, you understand every detail of it. Even if you copy it, all right? The fact that you are writing it down, it records in your brain the various details. A lot of times, if your, the figure is not yours, you have not done it, you may miss things. And you may miss things in a way that will lead you into the wrong solution. 
So write. What is then the next thing you have to do after you write the problem? You collect because you don't know where in the problem are the, the various parameters, where are they are defined. So go and write all of the parameters, their values that I give, and you write them together. All right, here I wrote them together, but in a problem, they're not going to be all together like that. They will be spread out throughout or sprinkled out throughout the problem. So you put them together. And so you write these values to, to make sure that you pay attention to them. And then you write what you have to find. So that is the first, first thing you have to do. Then before you start doing anything, obviously I'm asking you to do that using the Smith chart in this case. And I would say using the Smith chart. And then, so before you start thinking, or before you start doing stuff, outline your solution the approach, the steps you're going to follow without doing things, but you have to articulate how you're going to solve it. So here is how I would solve it and I will write it down. You see, that's how before, because if you start doing stuff without knowing how to get your solution, then, then you will not get your solution. The only thing is that you're going to write all kinds of stuff a lot of it is not going to be relevant. And what is the value of this? All right, the fact that you write more stuff, it does not give you any, any more value to what your solution. So here I'm outlining the solution, number one. So solution outline. That's how we do research as well. That's how we solve problems. You always think on how to go about solving your problem and then you do an execution in, of like taking every step and doing what you have to do. When you have to do a project, you think first of all, how you're gonna do the project. They assume you're gonna re renovate something in your house. You're not gonna start buying stuff, all right? You have to decide what you're gonna change and how you're gonna change it. That's how we do things in life. So do this here. All right. First of all, um, what? Let me let me think. I'm trying to think how to approach that. Obviously, I need to find a total impedance. I know that I have a line connected in series, and I know that I have another one with a load at the end. So what I was gonna do is transfer the load ZL to CC prime, and then transfer be open from E, E prime to B prime, C prime. All right, so I'm just saying that I will do that. So first of all, A, transfer. Um, before I even go there, okay, one thing, before I even do that, because I miss this, because I'm automatically thinking about this, but for you, it has to be part of your solution outline. You have to normalize everything. Normalize the lengths if they are not. Here, they are not all normalized with respect. I mean, they're given in terms of lambda. So that is called an electric length, if it is in terms of lambda. They are not in terms of physical units. So they're done. But if I were to give them to you in physical units, then, I will need to give you also the wavelength or the frequency, and then you would have to normalize those lengths as well. But they're normalized here. And then what you need to do next is to normalize your load or anything else you have on the line. Here, we only have a load, all right, ZL, because the other is open-ended. So you normalize your load and you say that your ZL, you have to normalize ZL to be normalized. And in fact, in this case, because this is easy, I'm going to do it. And my ZL normalized is going to be 1 plus J 0.5. And I have that in place. All right. Step two, B. 
I will transfer ZL to, what is it there? CC prime. So practically when I say that, what do I mean? That implies that I will find Z input on that line, which is, I call it, in fact, is line two, all right? Because I have, I will call them that, that Z2 at C, C prime. That's how I call it. And I indicate it here. That is gonna be for me, this one. That's what it is. So I will have to find that. And as a matter of fact, I will also find it, that I, not, I will have to find normalized since I'm gonna do everything with the Smith chart. Then, um, so that's B, that's C then. So transfer. Dr. Kate, do you mind if I ask a quick question? Sure, go ahead. Is, is that two on the normalized input impedance on B, is that a superscript or is that supposed to be like squared? No, it's a superscript. Okay. Yeah. If I were to put any of these as a square, I will put it in parentheses because there are so many superscript subscripts. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. All right. Thank you. Sure. So then transfer open circuit to B prime C prime. And here, I'm going to also show this here, and this is three, as Z in three in that line, practically, at B prime, C prime. And of course, for all of these, uh, for the uh, line, for the Smith chart will be normalized. Okay. Then what am I going to do? Now in D. After I, have, after I do this, what is going to happen to my circuit is going to change, obviously, if I only keep those impedances and get rid of the rest. So if I copy this and come here and paste it, so practically, I will eliminate this one. I don't need it. I don't need it. But I have a B prime here which I'm gonna, I have a C, excuse me, which I'm gonna keep. I have a line, which is like that. So that was yeah, C prime. And, and then here I have this load, which I'm gonna put, which is like the equivalent, the, it's my equivalent impedance where I found Z like to input C, C prime. And then here, I'm going to put between B prime and C prime, this other impedance. And in fact, I don't even have to do it like that. I will put it right up there. So I will put here um, this impedance Z3 input C, C prime normalized. Okay, so that's what I have now done. And then since I have two impedances in series, what am I going to do? And I know them, then I will combine them. So E as part E of my solution is to find the total of these two Uh, okay, here, I will find the total of these two. So practically, I will find ZT, which is Z2 in at CC prime plus Z3 input and C. Ah, this is B prime, C prime, sorry. B prime, C prime. So, and that is B prime, C prime. 
I will sum them up and find this impedance from these two. Then what is gonna be the next step to take this circuit and replace these two by ZT. So practically, if I take this and I copy it once more, and then I paste it here, then I will remove this, all right? And I, oops, and I will replace them by the ZT, which now is gonna con connect between B and B prime. It's gonna connect here. And now I have one load at the end of the line and I'm gonna transfer it. And then, so the final thing, which is F, is to transfer ZT to A, A prime. All right, so that for you now, this outline is important. If you don't do this outline, or if you don't know how to do it, because, okay, you may know it and feel comfortable that you know the steps well, so you don't have to write all of this. But if you don't know how to do it, and if you don't try to write anything down on how to do it, then you don't know how, then you're not going to, any, nothing is going to, then doing stuff is not going to help you. As a matter of fact, if you write it like this, I think you will be able to come down to the final step. You are going to be able, because it's going to be clean and then one step after the other are not difficult to see if you write it that cleanly. So you're going to find the solution. I, I can bet you anything on this. So now that we have done the outline, we're going to try to solve the problem. Okay, and so we have done two. So let me put um, check marks next to what we've done. We've done this. Now I'm going to B, section, part B. I wanna try to transfer ZL to CC prime and find this impedance here. I wanna it's find- It's five o'clock. I wanna find this one. Okay, so what I do is now I'm taking, um, I'm going here, which I have it, and try to do that, first of all. So let's find uh, the, the ZL, one plus J 0.5. Let me try to find ZL here. The real part is one. That tells me that it's gonna be, and so bear with me as I'm gonna do that. That tells me that it's gonna be along this line Okay, and as a matter of fact, I need to do it a little thicker. So that tells me that it's, um, that it's gonna be on this line, all right? That is the one that shows the real part. And then the imaginary part, I said it was one plus point, uh, plus point five. So I go to the upper side of the Smith chart, I look out uh, around here, I look, I look here, all right, to find 0.5, which in fact, 0.5 is right here. And then I'm writing this one now. And therefore, between these two, I'm finding this point. All right, and that point is my Z sub L. So here, I can go there and I can do that. And right here, that this is my Z sub L. All right, what do we know when this bell is gonna be at the end of this line, you see? So you have a section of a line with a load at the end. So then how do I find to transfer on this line 
to the front of the line where it's like CC prime is the front of that section of the line. I need to transfer that impedance and find the input impedance at CC prime. For this line that I'm outlining here, there is only one circle for this transmission line. It's the circle for the transmission line. That circle here, now I will erase this part because I don't need too many lines now that I found the point. Now I'm going to write the circle that goes through this, that has a center at the center of the Smith, Smith chart and goes through this point. And this circle, I'm going to put a green. I will also change it. And in fact, I'm going to do it like that. And then I'm, it's, a, it's this circle. Okay, um, I have to fix it, of course. Okay, that is this and a little bigger. Okay, this is the circle for the line, maybe. Let me see whether I can make it. No, better like that. Okay, this is the circle for the line. Now I want to move on this circle. Do you see it well? I'm going to do it like that. Okay, but I want to move on this circle from the end of the line towards the source. All right, so the end of the line is here. I want to move on this circle like this towards the source like or towards the generator. So I will go here in the on the outer rim, which is here, and says wavelength towards generator. And practically that tells you that I have to move like that. Okay. So from where I am, I will move on this line and I will use this red because I will always tell you to show when you move on a line to go from where to where. I will have to move on this line by how much? They're telling me by I have to go from one end of the line to the other. So I have to move by D2 and D2 here is 0.2 lambda. So from there, where I am, I have to move by 0.2 lambda. Where am I going to find that, however? Because I only measure movement at the outer rims of this circle. And practically, where I measure it on this yellow one. All right. So I need to find where I am so I can add to this the distance I have to walk like, rather, and then go and find my end point. So how do we find this? We develop, we, we, we connect this point with the center of the Smith chart. And we put it like there. And as a matter of fact, the style. So that is where, what I do, I connect this point with, and I, I do all of these lines with that, it because they're auxiliary lines. All right. So if we have too many, you will not know what is your primary. In fact, this is a primary. And maybe for this one, I will use this, the, the circle of your transmission line is a primary line on the Smith chart. But lines that help you find points or help you find where you are, these are auxiliary lines. Usually we don't need them to keep them, especially in complex problems. But here I will keep them for as long as I can. So this one I connect it, I go on the outer rim where I'm, I'm moving. And then I wanna find what point this one is. And if I find it, when I look at that point, the number that I'm reading is 0 0.1424, it's 0 0.144 lambda. So, uh, from there, I have to walk by 0.2 lambda. So to that, I will have to add 
another point to lambda, which is how far I have to transverse. And this is going to give me 0.344 lambda. So I will move from there until I find 0.344. Where is, where is 0.344? I have to move until I find 0.344. And 0.344 is down here. All right. Uh, three, four, and then for another four. So practically, I have to move down here. Okay. And to see where, where this point corresponds on the small green circle, I do also another thing. I connect. this line with this one and then i find where these two lines intersect the the dotted pink with the green one and they intersect at that point and that's the point where i will have to stop i will go around from here so practically, practically, I will start at that point. I will go around and continue until I find this point. And then I will stop there. And then, how I show that on the Smith chart. You need to, to do it so you remember. Ah, that is not, that's too thick. So what I was gonna do on the Smith chart is so like that, because that shows my movement. Otherwise I may get confused and I may think for a moment that I have moved the other direction because that makes a difference. Okay, so I move from ZL and this point here, now I will remove the pink line because I will remove the two pink lines. I don't need them. And then I will remove this one. Okay. So now that I found this point, I know that this point is nothing else but my input impedance. So practically, I can do this and then bring it here so this is my input impedance and i will write it this is z not this one so here this is z um to input at cc prime and it's normalized obviously okay now i will read it to find out how much it is all right, how do I find the readings, the real and imaginary part? I will do the same thing again here. Really go there. So first of all, I have to read the real part. To read the real part, I'm going along a real part circle and I'm stopping there. And what do I read for real part is it's one point say zero eight approximately. So I will write here what I read, which is point, oops, no, this is two. It's point zero. No, it's one point. It's one point zero eight. Okay, and then I'm below the horizontal line of the Smith chart that goes from the center. So it's negative, the ima imaginary, the reactive part of this will be negative. And then to read it also, I will go on this line, but I will go like this. And I will check what I'm reading, what the reading is down here. What the reading there is, in fact, is this one. 
And if you see, it's like very close to 0.5, a little bit above it. So I will say it's about 0 0.50, like say two. And that's the Z um, that I found when I transferred from here on this transmission line to this point. So I found this one now. So that is, no, I found it. And I, as a matter of fact, I can write it even here for, for completeness, 1.08, 1.08. Eight minus J point five zero two. Okay, now I will do the same thing for this other line down here. The only thing is that um, there is a little something easier here that at the end is open circuit. So I don't have to find the load at the end. I go directly, and as a matter of fact, now I can remove this. I can remove this because I found that point. So now I'm going to an open end. Could you find me an open end? Where is the, op the point of an open end on this Smith chart? What point represents an open end? Is an open end considered like an infinite impedance? So would it be like on the center on the center horizontal line all the way to the right? Exactly. So it is right here. So that's the load of the line that goes vertically down. All right, that's an open end. And therefore, what is the circle that goes through this line? What is the circle of this line? Rather, what is the circle of the purple line? This, huh? The entire edge of the chart. Yes. So it's, I will use a different, uh, what color? I will use also, well, I, you, you use the blue. So it's going to be this one. And in fact, let me do it a little thicker. No, <laughs> that's not what I had in mind, this one. Let me do it like, it's not exactly that, I'll fix it, right? So it has to go like here, 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 here. So practically, that is the um, line, the transmission line, circle for any transmission line that has an open or a short at the end. Do you agree? Who disagrees with that or who is not sure that this is correct? Anybody? I, I hear crickets. <laughs> Nothing. Do you agree or disagree? Do you hear me? Can you hear me? Agree. Yeah, agree. Okay. All right. So, um, from here, what I will have to do, this is my point. Let me also do this so it does not interfere style. Do this like that for a moment, okay? And then this is my point. I did not, there, that's my point. And I have to move along this line now by 0.1 of a wavelength. 
So to be able to move by 0.1 of a wavelength, I'm very clear, I'm very close here. I don't need to do too many things. So practically, this is my beginning point, and that is um, here, here. That is 0.25. That's where I'm starting, lambda. All right. And then I have to add to it 0.1 lambda. So if I add to that point, if I have to travel by 0.1 lambda, this is going to have to bring me to the 2.35 lambda. So I have to move along until I find 3.35 lambda. And as a matter of fact, it's right here, very close to it. So 0.35 is here. So practically, I have to move up until this point. And if I move up until this point, I don't need, I mean, in reality, the accurate is to connect with the center of the Smith chart, but to, to avoid that, because I'm so close, the point, therefore, I have to stop here. All right. And by, let me zoom, do this because, uh, and also make, make it a little smaller so I can do the, the arrows. Okay, if I do it like that, then I can show you how I'm moving. So you remember I told you, oops, there. I need to do the arrows in this one. Okay. So now I found that Z in, which is here. And I'm going to write it down. So that Z in, what is the interesting thing you find out, as Lauren said earlier? that the impedance there will be either capacitive or inductive, depending on how far you go. But in this particular case, since it's in the lower hemisphere, all right, of the, of the Smith chart, it's gonna be negative, J, and then point here, whatever I, I read for the reactive part, which is gonna be practically minus one because this is the readings, all right? It's between 1.2 and 1.4. So it's 1.2, 1.3, 1.38. So it's gonna be 1.0, excuse me, no, point one. 1. 1.38. So now I have found both of those. And practically, I think something moved, so I will have to move this too. Okay. Dr. Katahi? Yes. On the uh, impedance uh, with the two subscript, is that supposed to be a J in front of the 0 0.502? Yes. Thank okay, you. thank you. So now I'm going to sum the two, as I said, in my solution, all right? So ZT, therefore normalized, is going to be the sum of the two, which I have it and it's easy to do. So it's going to be Z in three plus Z in two. And, and this is at B prime, C prime. And this one is at CC prime. And I just find is minus J 1.38 plus 1.08 minus J 0 0.502, which in fact makes it 1.08. And then I have 2, 8. Eight, right one 
minus j. Let me write this a little better. Okay. So that's what I get for zt. Now that I have zt, I can finish the rest of the problem. All right, I, can, I will find zt, obviously. I'm gonna go and find this point. And for that, I can, I can use a different, a new version of the Smith chart. I mean, this already has a lot of lines there. So I will copy and go down below and rather put it here, paste. And then I will clean it up. Okay, so I will do this. This. Just to help, so we don't have too many things going on. Eventually, you can do when you get comfortable with all of this, you can do only one. All right. So now I'm going to find z sub t and I will move z sub t here since I calculated. So let me also copy this. Copy. Take that here. All right. And now I'm going to go and find z sub t on this Smith chart. So again, I will have to go and find the real part is 1.08. So this, and then I will use this, and also this, and then find the 1.08, which is somewhere here. That's the circle that gives the real part and it's minus 1.882. So minus 1.882, minus one, okay, it's down here, 1.8. So it go down here, eight two. So it goes down here, I believe. And therefore, I will need to find the intersection of these two, which is right there. So ZT is this one, all right? So that is my ZT. Okay. So now that I found ZT, I can erase these parts and this. And what do I need to do to be able to transfer ZT? I need to find the circle of this line that goes through ZT. And the circle for this line is gonna be this one. Well, no, I'm gonna use this one. So it's gonna be, let me write the circle and then I will adjust it. So it has to move through this. Okay, approximately. And now again, the same kind of thing. I need to move there by 0.1 of a wavelength. So then I'm gonna draw a line here. And see where I am. And I am somewhere here. And so I'm gonna write that value. Here it's point three one three one three lambda. And there I'm gonna add another point one. 
lambda and that this is how much I have to transverse and this is going to give me point four one three lambda. So now I have to go and find four point four one three lambda, which is four one three, which is here. All right. And then I'm going to connect that point with the center of the Smith chart. Somewhere there. Okay. And I will find where that intersects. With the um, purple circle, the circle of the transmission line. So practically it intersects right here. Which tells me I will have to move like this along the line always going towards the generator. Until I find that point and that is going to be my final input impedance in the beginning of the line. All right, and it's going to be like I will write it. No, I, I did not mean that. Okay, so that is Z in. Huh? Z in at A, A prime. And as a matter of fact, I can, can read it right now. And how am I going to read it? I use a different color right now. Let's assume that I will do this. And I will go like that and like this. And from here, I'm going to find which is the resistive part. So I have to go on a circle like this, which is approximately 0.32. And then I will have to find the reactive part that is going to go like this. And is about minus 0.54, something five. So I'm going to write here. Okay. I'm going to write that Z input I found it is. 0.3.318 minus J 0.548, something like that. So now I solve the problem. All right, I found exactly Z in. And the value is given here. Any questions before we continue? Okay. No question. So let me then. What is the next? Uh, the question. We are not done with the problem. The problem says also. Ah, uh, fine. No, that's all the problem said. Okay. Let's assume that now there is another problem and say on the basis of that I continue with the problem. So now I'm I'm doing problem two. It's a continuation rather. Say, 
find the reflection coefficient coefficient work on the front line. How do we call that? On line, on this line, on the line AA prime, BB prime. We want to find the reflection coefficient on transmission line AA prime, BB prime. Okay. Who is going to tell me how to do that? That's that's the line, that's the circle. The purple one is the circle for that transmission line. So who is gonna tell me how to do this? Uh, first you mean like a straight line? Yes, from where? Well, I think you start on the left side of the circle. Yes. So let me then um, develop, um, let me, what else colors do I have? I will use this one. So I'm going from here and I'm drawing a straight line, which is perpendicular. And then? You can just read the, the little chart down there to find the reflection coefficient. Yes. And do you remember which one is this? It's right this one, all right? That says reflection coefficient E or I. And from there we find that the reflection coefficient on this line, the magnitude is 0.5246, say six, two. So that is the reflection coefficient. Okay. Now, um let's assume well let me before i go to that when you have a transmission so i found the coefficient so the reflection coefficient magnitude rather it's 0.562 now let's see how we are going to find the face of the reflection coefficient all right so how we are going to do that the face of the reflection coefficient, if you want to find it, you're going to go here. You see this reading? Let me use this blue. You see it says here? Angle of reflection coefficient. So when you are at the, at any point here on this line, um, practically, when you are at the load, rather, it says here for a, so um, this gives you the reflection coefficient at the load, okay? It does not give you the reflection coefficient at any other point on the line. That you will have to figure it out, but it gives you the reflection coefficient at the load. But if you know the reflection, the, the, the face of the reflection coefficient at the load, you can find the reflection coefficient everywhere. Why is that? Because we know that on this, on this transmission line, and then I will bring it down here, this one, all right? So let me look at this line here, copy. In this transmission line, at any point on the line, all right, so let me now um, remind you how we are looking at this transmission line, how we have set it up. So we have a Z axis. Usually the beginning is at the source. Let's assume that you have a source here that is connected like that for a moment. All right, and let's assume that this source gives you one milliwatt of power. 
Okay. Now, when we set this up, we give, we put z equals zero here, and then we put here z equals d one. Now, if I want to find the phase, what we know about, let me start with that. What I know about the reflection coefficient at this, at some random point on this line, the, where it's z, we call that z. So this is z, obviously, and then the z. Let me erase that part for a moment, right, clearly. This is z, and then also we have defined this dimension, this distance from your load to be z prime, all right? These are the two uh, distances. They're both positive. And also z plus z prime equals d1. Okay. Now, um, we have found that gamma at z prime distance from the load rather is equal to magnitude of gamma at the load times um, e to minus j to beta z prime times e to the j well before i go there i don't wanna so let's that's what we have found for now, all right? We have found that the reflection coefficient at any point is the reflection coefficient at the load times this exponential. Now, if the reflection coefficient at the load has a magnitude and a phase from these two, I can find that the reflection coefficient at any distance from the load is equal to gamma L magnitude at the load times, let me move this a little bit so I have space here, times e to the, min, e to the minus two beta Z prime minus phi sub L. And therefore I say that the, my reflection coefficient has magnitude, therefore the magnitude of gamma at Z prime equals gamma L. So the magnitude of the reflection coefficient is the same everywhere on the line. And then phase of the reflection coefficient at z prime is equal to if we if we assume that minus and j remain to beta z prime minus phi sub l. Okay, that is the phase. So um, and in fact, you can even put it here, put the minus in there, and leave only the j out. Okay, so that is the phase if we want to find it. We find the magnitude by drawing this vertical line down and to find the phase at any distance of the line from here, we can use this formula, but we need to know phi sub L. And phi sub L, you can find it from the Smith chart. So if this is my load ZT and then I connect it, Remember, I wanted to find where I am on this outer path, on the yellow outer path. That's what I looked at at the time I was looking here. If I extend this, this one here, and I read what I see right here, that shows me the phase of the, reflect, of the reflection coefficient at the load. And the phase there, it's minus 14 degrees. It's, and then it's 42, 44, minus 45 degrees. So from there, I also find that phi sub L is minus 45 degrees. 
And that is extremely important if I wanna find the phase of the reflection coefficient, right? So now I can say that the phase of the reflection coefficient in the beginning of the line, so is um, phase of um, gamma at z prime is equal now to minus two beta z prime minus 45 degrees. So now I can find it by adding the pay, but the part that has z prime, I can find it anywhere on the line. If z prime, as I said, is point, we said that if, if my z, if I am all the way at the source, if I am right here, then my distance z prime, my distance from the load is d1, which is 0.1 of wavelength. So practically, if this is 0.1 of a wavelength, then 2 beta z prime will be 4 pi over lambda times 0.1 lambda. And that gives us um, 4 pi is 367, 20. All right, it's like in degrees, 720 degrees times 0.1 which is 72 degrees. So practically gamma in the beginning of the line, of the line, that's an AA prime, is gonna have the magnitude that we found before, which is 0.562, and that does not change. And it's gonna have a phase of minus 72, minus 45, which is gonna be minus 72, minus 45, or that is gonna give seven, that. Okay, so that's how I find the whole reflection coefficient. All right, any questions so far about this? Um, how we found uh, the phase at, at the load, can we do that at the at AA prime just by looking uh, mm -hmm. at the point? Mm -hmm. the... Yes, as a matter of fact, if you don't care about what happens in between, you can go at the end of your line, draw the line all the way out there, and instead of stopping the, the blue line, uh, let me see this one. Instead of stopping this one there, you continue here and look what you find. You find minus, what did I find? 117, which is probably very close, minus 117. See? You can find it from there if you don't care to find in between. Yes. Now, why gamma magnitude is important? It is important for the following reason. Do you remember power from circuits? How do you find the power that is dissipated in a resistor. So if you have, let me ask you this, uh, just to, to um, do you have a resistor, R, and then there is a current, I, how much is dissipated in the resistor? How do you find it? In the complex, in the in the complex plane, when you have all kinds of different circuits, and you put like, eventually you may have here a capacitor, you may have an inductor, whatever. So you put R um, one over J omega C in impedance form J omega L. 
All right. How do you find the power? The that... squared r. What's that? Is it r squared r? Yeah, but yeah, let's start before we go there. It's v i complex conjugate. You remember that? Yes. And where is v? Is um, i r. So you, you are correct, and therefore it goes r magnitude of r squared. Now there is another thing that I wanted to remind you. Can I ask something that yes. I'm, and I get sometimes I get confused about. Uh, I think there's another one that uses the the v squared. There's another formula for the power dissipated, right? Mm -hmm. If we use this formula with the voltages that we use, if we have like an AC uh, voltage, it's going to be the RMS or it's going to be just. Ah, the... see, that's very good. Thank you for making reference because that's the next one. If you go, if you're, for example, in, in our phasers, if you remember, we define if we have V of T equals, say, um, and, and magnitude and amplitude, usually we call it amplitude, cosine omega T, that's your uh, harmonic, all right? In the phasor form, if you remember, we, well, before we go to phasors, we said V of T was the real part of V naught E to the J omega T, all right? And we called V naught the phasor. So we said the phasor of V of T, is V naught. In this case, the way we have defined it, V naught is the amplitude. All right? So it is the peak value. Yes, it's the peak value. If you go to RMS value, how much is your RMS? For example, you would, with RMS value, so this is peak value here. I mean, V naught is peak value. And then if, however, your V of T, V of T is um, V RMS cosine omega T, how much is your V RMS? Is it not that? Yes. Good. Or like this, you will see it. Because what is the VRMS? If your if your circuit is like that, if your um, cosine, if your uh, harmonic is like this, this is the peak value. Okay. VRMS is an average that you don't get it from here, but it's like this one. RMS, which is V naught divided by 1.4 something. Okay. Is it 1.4 square root of 2? How much is it? Yes. Okay. So if you have VRMS, then what happens? Your um, power is your, um, in this case, if the value is VRMS, practically, how is it gonna be? It's gonna be, your VRMS, um, I complex conjugate, which in fact is gonna give you, is that how we go, we do it? One over two. Um, v not I complex conjugate, something like that. Why do we have the one half? 
because VRMS is one over square root and then um, of, of V naught, which means also I, well, I'm, I'm sorry, this one is supposed to be R here or whatever, something there as before. Ah, because if V, if you have VRMS, then you are gonna have I RMS. Then you, all of your values move into RMS. And then VRMS, I need to find out what the book has because in different places they have V naught over square root of two and I RMS will be I naught over square root of two. And then when you plug in and you're, you have only RMS, if everything you mention is in RMS. So in this case, your P is gonna be a PRMS. And in that case, you will have to find it like this because you plug in for the RMS values, it's gonna give you one over two R, whatever, in a maximum. Is that clear? Yes. Uh, okay. So it's just how you, you, it's a matter of definition, but you, it has to give you the same. Um, if, for example, your V, your PRMS is this, then you know how to go from PRMS to peak. All right. So as long as you stick, and I need to see what the book is doing for a second. What the book is using. Second, let me just find the place where it shows about power. I'll do it here at the back. The book is using peak values. So it uses the first one. Okay. Yeah. Now it's there's no problem, you know, if you use P, as long as you know what you're talking about. So you can go from one to another. And usually in most cases, um, the absolute that's why I don't we don't put that much attention whether it's PRMS or whether it's peak, because in these circuits. What is important is not how much is your absolute value, but how much you absorb. Do you have 100% efficiency that you absorb all of the power? Or do you have 50% efficiency where you reflect, like you absorb only 50%, all right? So it's always a ratio with regards to something. But anyway, the book, the book is using, I have seen other books, unfortunately, books, we don't, we have some standards, we are not that, <laughs> that strict. So a lot of books are going either with RMS or with PIC. And I always use PIC power just um, because if you start going to one over two, you will not remember. I mean, I, I have started with PIC and that's what I'm doing. So any other questions? Now, I, I was continuing, all right? So now that we know the power from um, here, this is a circuit theory. So let me just uh, put all of this together in one. Right. And say from circuit theory, from Now, what I would like to do is to see 
Now that I know the reflection coefficient, if I knew that my source provides five watts, I gonna see for this reflection coefficient, how much do I absorb by the circuit? All right, so what happens is the following. Let me, let me assume here that they have a transmission line, my transmission line rather, so I'm gonna go here and then make it a little thick. So we have my trust, our transmission line. Duplicate here. And then we have the load at the end, our load, which we found, ZT. And we have a source in the, on the front. And this source gives one milliwatt. What I would like to find out is how much, now that I have done all of this, how much power is absorbed by my load, by everything that I have um, behind, after all right, after the source, I wanna see how much is absorbed. In this case, to find out how much it is absorbed, we need to see how much is reflected, obviously. So here is what we have. We have an incident way, we have an incident, let me, let me write it as following. Um, let me write it as a matter of fact. So we have, a, a total V, all right, which is a function of Z and is an incident of V plus, plus a reflected, okay? And then we have an I of Z, which is I plus of Z plus I minus of Z. Okay, so the reflection coefficient gamma is practically V minus is a function of Z. So I'm going to the definition right now. It's a function of Z and is V minus of Z divided. It's six o'clock. By V plus of Z. That's uh, the reflection coefficient. And also, if we remember, it has a magnitude, which is the mag the reflection, the magnitude of the reflection coefficient at the load, um, times a, a e exponential a phase for the reflection coefficient. So we'll call it phase here. All right. Now, let let us think of the following. If the line was infinite long, this line that has a characteristic impedance Z naught. So it would go for a long time, many infinite, many wavelengths before that electromagnetic, um, that voltage or current, all right, would ever reach the load. That means that I will not have a reflection. Do you agree? If my load, if this line is infinite long, practically I have no reflection on the line. So for an infinite long line, the reflection on the line is zero. At any point, there is no reflection. The same thing applies if I have a load which is equal to the characteristic impedance. So if I have what I call a matched line, that means that the load is equal to the characteristic impedance, then gamma at any point on the line is zero. Okay? So the two are identical. If I have a zero reflection, then the power that is provided by the source is the incident power. It goes and eventually it, absor it is absorbed, all right? 
So, which means that the incident power here, I can show it like that, is going to be V plus, all right? And since it's a V plus is a function of Z, I plus, which is also a function of Z, but that is going to be complex conjugate. Now, look at this that um, I have defined uh, V plus of Z to be V naught E to the minus J beta Z. And I have defined I plus of Z to be V naught over Z naught E to the minus J beta Z, okay? And as a matter of fact, this is also how we define the characteristic impedance. So the characteristic impedance is nothing else, if you like, uh, that I could have defined it as I naught e to the minus j beta z. And the characteristic impedance is nothing else but the ratio of v naught over I naught, practically. Okay. Now, if I take these three equations, and plug in V plus of Z and I plus of Z, but complex conjugate. What I have is that P plus, so this is one, two, and three. I find from one, two, and three, that P plus is equal to V naught. And then I have squared over Z naught, okay? So practically, I have the P plus, which is the incident power, is independent of Z and is just the incident power. And that's gonna be nothing else, but um, the real power that comes out of the, um, it is the power that comes out of the source, which is one milliwatt. Somebody gave it to us, all right? That is the source power. Now, what happens when the reflection coefficient is not zero? In that case, we have two types of powers. We have P incident plus which is practically your V, and, and if we assume that V may be also complex, we write it like that, all right? For any, just in case it's a complex number, we write it like this. So if we assume, this is then it's gonna be V naught square, magnitude square divided by Z naught. If we have a, ref, a, a reflection coefficient which is zero, your reflected power is gonna be gamma, and then how much do we have gamma here? A gamma, we don't have any. Gamma's magnitude, and that is gonna be P plus. So practically, if we know the reflection coefficient, you can write it also, P reflected, you can say, can be square root of gamma, magnitude, excuse me, magnitude of gamma squared, P incident. So that tells you that if you have a source which is connected to um, a line where, and the line has a reflection coefficient, from the incident power only, part of the incident power goes to the load because um, part of it is reflected. And because we wanna have we don't want to violate the second law of thermodynamics. So the total incident power is going to be the ref reflected power plus what we call the transmitted power to the load. All right, so there are two types of power, the incident and the reflected. And the difference between the two
is what gets into the load, which I call PL instead of transmitted. And in fact, I don't like transmitted. It's like a disease. Okay, so it's like this one. All right, and that is important. So that's why yes. Is the difference between the reflected and the incident, right? Yes, the difference always the incident is higher than the reflected. Is there is there a difference between okay uh, between the when you have the subscript in lowercase for the reflected power or or the uppercase or they're basically the same. Oh, you mean in terms of the letters I'm using? Yeah. No, they're the same. I'm okay. sorry. Yeah, I'm, I'm not. I don't. I have not practiced discipline in that regard. So it needs to be. Yeah, you're yeah, right because you never know. All right, it can be different. Yeah, correct. So and um. It's important to know how much power goes to the load if you know, I mean, even if you don't know the input, you can say what percentage of the power goes to the load, to the, to the load. And if you don't know if your P input is whatever it is, then you can, you can write P reflected to be magnitude of gamma squared P incident, which means from here, that your PL will be P incident one my minus magnitude of gamma squared. And then if you wanna know percentage, you have to take the ratio of the two. And that's gonna give you one minus magnitude of gamma squared. So you know what percentage of your power goes to the load. That's why the magnitude of gamma is far more important than anything else, because it gets into the calculations for the power. Any other questions? Also, we'll cover this anyways, but I wanted just to cover it here in the context of things. We'll cover it in class. Yes. Uh, just the notes, at least. Uh, you know, uh, it, I will put them on the web. OK. Yeah, yeah. In fact, what I was going to do, I can send this right now to myself and I will try before I leave, go home to do this um, so you can have access to it. So let me I, see. I, I missed today's lecture. Um, I couldn't attend this morning. W was there any uh, important announcement or anything? that I? No, to today's lecture, so the only thing that I did was to solve a problem. Okay. And I will put those, I, by tomorrow morning, I will put those. So the problems I solved are to help you with the homework. Okay. One last question before I leave. For the team homework, uh, I think... You... Remind me what the team homework says. Can you, can you bring it up? Yeah, I don't have a specific question, uh -huh. but I think you didn't uh, explicitly say whether you want us to use uh, Smith chart or not. I'm not sure. Ah, let me see. I, I think I can uh, get the uh, homework. Just a second. From here. There. I got the individual. I'll get the team. Now this. Yes, I, the problems I solved are good. In fact, I solved the, the problems I solved today are good for um, both the individual and the team. What is uh, I gave you in the team homework 120 points, if you notice. Yeah, I noticed that. Yeah, and I did that because I have some things there that I will be a little more involved. And I wanted you to work as a team and then to be able. So here, for example, it's so a, we're not required to use Smith chart for the homework. For the team homework. No, you can. But we're not required. Or are no, we? you don't. You are not required. You are not required at all. It just says you can solve it any way you like. Okay. Okay. Sounds yeah. good. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, are the two loads in the individual homework in parallel? Uh, yes. I'm kind of confused on how to combine those. Ah, were you in class today? Yes, I was. I, section, what section are you in? 
I'm in the morning section. Ah, okay. So um, let me show you, and probably I will do, but without the, what should I do? Because I have a problem solving that I did for the afternoon section. Let me see. Do you usually post the question that you did in both, uh, you know, sessions on the on Canvas or just the one that you did for our session? No, what I was going to do is I will put both problems. Okay. Um, but I think, um, I don't know whether you, I can put both videos too, because I solved two different problems. Yeah, that would be. All right. I have no problem because I'm done. It seems it's not extra work for me to put it. I just need to get, send a note to people so they don't get confused to tell them that this is and be clear on how, but I have no problem doing it because I gave two separate problems to different problems, like you see here. Thank right? you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. In fact, um, I have, let me see, did I finish that sending to myself this one? No, I need to do this. So. I think it's easier to use uh, AirDrop to if you want to transfer it. Uh, I don't know. How, I have to tell you. I don't know what is going on with the, the AirDrop. How do you? I mean, my are mine are connected. How would I use AirDrop to put just, it? In? Just the same way you share it, but you're gonna see AirDrop, you know, icon in the, you know, when, when you hit what share. Do I, what do I do with that? And you just press on it and you will see your device, your computer, MacBook on there. Just hit on it and suddenly it will be transferred over there. Oh. Like at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, good. You would see it in the downloads on your MacBook. Oh, that's where it goes. Well, I have not tried it. I have to tell you. Yeah, a lot of people have told me, but I, <laughs> what they say, all an old, you try to teach an old dog new tricks, and there is so much capacity for that. <laughs> so, but in any case, yeah, that's a good idea. In fact, um, yeah, no, I would like, I will do this in fact right now. The only thing that I have to do is. Oh, I can stop this sharing.